was election night, 2008, more than a decade ago now, and it felt like the whole world was watching. But the moments that I remember most vividly, no one captured. When I found out that I was working for the next president of the United States of America, I was standing alone outside of a bus filled with the journalists who were working to capture every detail of the evening. We were waiting on the lowest level of a downtown street in Chicago for Senator Obama to join the motorcade. I had stepped outside of the bus to take a call from my husband. And in that moment, all I would remember is his voice. He had called to tell me congratulations. He had seen the news reports that they had just called Ohio for Senator Obama, and he knew it was only a matter of time. He said, you're with the president-elect, Johanna. I never could have imagined that moment growing up in my little hometown of Galesburg, Illinois. Galesburg is a uh, typical Midwestern manufacturing town. We had about 30,000 people. We had a quaint downtown. Um, we had two railroad stations and um, a daycare in our high school. We had the daycare because we had one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the state of Illinois. My mom used to joke that, of course, Galesburg had a high teen pregnancy rate because there was nothing else to do in Galesburg other than grow your hair long and uh, have premarital sex. <laughs> in truth, she had experience with both. <laughs> I had always known that my parents had longer hair in high school. But when I was 21 years old, I found out that my parents were that story that they had had a child in high school, that they together had gotten pregnant, but it was my mom alone who was sent to a school for teenage pregnant girls, where they bandaged her breasts, hoping that she wouldn't produce milk for a child that they would suggest she give up for adoption. And I don't think she felt like she had much of a voice in that decision. After my parents got married, and had me, they took the opportunity to leave their home state of Kansas and move to Illinois. And they would do everything to give me and then my two brothers the opportunity to find our voices. The first time I heard President Obama's voice was when a lot of us heard his voice. The Democratic National Convention had chosen a little known state senator to give a really big convention speech. And I remember listening to that speech. When he started talking about his unlikely journey, I started listening. When he talked about his family's Kansas values, I related. And when he talked about my hometown of Galesburg, Illinois, and the desperation that so many felt because manufacturing had left our little manufacturing town, I knew he understood. When he talked about a tolerant America, a generous America, an America better united than divided, I knew I would do anything to work to see his voice get to the highest office in the land. It was before that moment, when I was 21 years old, I was at the University of Kansas, and my parents called, and they said, you need to come home now. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm at college, and I'm doing really well. And they said, no, you need to come home now. And the next thing I knew, I was on a train headed to Galesburg, Illinois. I got home, and I was seated next to my two younger brothers across from my parents, where they said to us, when we were in high school, we had a child. We gave him up for adoption, and he's come back to us. It was the first time in my life I was ever truly surprised. 
In the coming weeks, they would drive us to meet my new brother and his family. And I would see a weight that I didn't know my mom was carrying lift off of her shoulders just to know that her son was OK. She had never had that worry with me. She had gotten to raise me to be fiercely independent. When I was in middle school, I decided I didn't like their rules. <laughs> so I said to my mom, it's my life, and I intend to live it. Rather than argue with me, she said, OK, write it down. And I did. And she put it up in a cabinet and saved it there, I think until just a couple years ago, so that if ever there were any issues, she could remind me it was my life and I was living it. <laughs> um, when I was in college, I knew that my political affiliation was different than my larger extended family. So I chose the most opportune time to come out to your family as a Democrat. Christmas dinner, <laughs> there wasn't a supportive voice around the table. But when I went to work for Democrats, even when they didn't agree with me, my parents were proud because I had a voice. By the time Senator Obama was thinking about running for president, I had used my voice in politics in Kansas, on a campaign in Iowa, as a press secretary, and I had decided I wanted to work on the Obama campaign. So I did the very Midwestern thing of welcoming the state director to the neighborhood with freshly baked bread every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him that he was going to give me a job on the Obama campaign. He laughs now when he tells the story, because he did everything he could to avoid me. I mean, mind you, this was 2006. They hadn't even announced. He didn't have an office. He didn't have any staff. But um, eventually, he relented. Uh, he told me, you're going to do press advance. And I was like, what's that? I had done communications. Little did I know, he was setting me up for a role where I would get to set the stage for history, open the doors to the journalists who would capture it, and see more for myself in almost every state and 42 countries around the world. It was a dream I could have never imagined, and it was never what I aspired to in Iowa. All I wanted to do was make a difference. I remember those early days very well. And it's always funny to me now, because I think people look back on it and they think maybe it was predestined or preordained or this was always going to happen. And when I look back, I remember the skeptics, the people who would say, Barack Hussein Obama, are you crazy? <laughs> like, ha, 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 good luck with that one. Good. You, you just go do that. Um, you know, in truth, we weren't resonating in Iowa. And um, we would have all these events, and people would leave the events, and um, they'd say, oh, he's a celebrity. I'm not that interested. It wasn't until President Obama came back from a trip to Greenwood, South Carolina, that I saw those dynamics change. Mind you, I saw all of these events from the front row, like right here in front of the audience. And I remember vividly when he started telling that story, he had come back from Greenwood. He had never wanted to go. He would tell the story. It was probably like Galesburg. It was far away from any airport. You had to drive a long way. It was rainy. He you know, got there, and the crowd was half full. He was disappointed. And he would tell the story, and uh, you know he's having to shake hands because he's running for president. And a little lady in a church hat in the back of the room, he would always describe, would start chanting, fired up, ready to go. And everyone would join her, fired up, ready to go, fired up, ready to go. 
And he would say, with a chuckle, you know, I kind of felt at first like she was showing me up. <laughs> and then he'd say, you know, but eventually I started kind of feeling fired up. And I kind of felt ready to go. <laughs> and he'd use that story and he'd say, it goes to show you, Iowa, that if one voice can change a room, one voice can change a state, one voice can change a nation, one voice can change the world. And then he'd say, you know, what do you think, Iowa? Are you fired up? Are you ready to go? And at this point, Iowans were standing out of their chairs, chanting, fired up, ready to go, fired up, ready to go. It was the 10-year anniversary of that caucus victory that a bunch of us got back together in Des Moines, Iowa. Only this time, I got to bring my son. I had become a mother during the administration, and I realized that I think differently now as a mother about the power of one voice than I did before. And I know that voice is more than just what we say. It's how we conduct ourselves. It's the example that we set. It's the respect we show others. And I know that it matters because whether it's a mother who teaches her daughter that she can do anything, even if she herself has not been so lucky, that matters. Whether it's a mother who teaches her son to believe in a tolerant America, though she knows well that we have farther to go, that matters. And whether it's a little lady in a church hat, Edith Childs, who has the courage to inspire the next president of the United States of America, that matters. And we all have that power. Chicago, that night, that election night, on that lowest level of that downtown street, the words struck me. You're with the president-elect, Johanna. The voice I had come to know so well over two years of a grueling campaign was about to become one of the most powerful in the world. It was humbling. I hung up the phone and looked around the street. It was dusty and serenely quiet. From what seemed like nowhere, there was security everywhere. I got back on the bus. Shortly after, the president-elect came downstairs and joined the motorcade. And we would drive over to the election site, Grant Park. I would walk two photojournalists backstage so that they could capture the last moments before the president-elect would give the last speech of the 2008 campaign. And I stood back. I saw David Axelrod. And knowing what a pivotal voice he had on that campaign, always telling Senator Obama to keep going, I said, you did this. And he leaned over to me and he said, we did this. And he was right. No one person could take credit for this victory, not even the candidate. Because it was the voices of thousands of field organizers. It was the voices of volunteers across the country. It was the voices of precinct captains. It was the voices of our extraordinary directors, the voices of our partners, the voices of our parents, and the voice of Edith Childs, whose story set up an extraordinary backdrop. For the next six years as part of the administration, I would see President Obama's voice change so many rooms. But I fear sometimes that we leave the story there 
And I think we're missing the bigger point. You know, people come to me now a decade later and they'll say, when they find out I worked for President Obama, don't you miss him? We miss him. Don't you think we need him back? <laughs> and yes, of course I miss him. And it would be great to have him back. But the truth is, we proved on election night, it's not just one voice. To truly change the balance of power, it takes a chorus.